damn, finishing up that last act of Arcane, not really knowing what to do, staying awake all night with my eyes wide open, wondering what could possibly happen, couldn't be me, because I don't stay awake at all. I fall asleep immediately with the fantastic sponsor of this video, Helix. Helix Sleep has premium mattresses customized to fit all of your needs and shipped to your door. They have a special sleep quiz that matches you to your perfect mattress based all on your preferences. It also includes free shipping through the entire US and they are easy to set up and get rolling. They have 20 unique mattresses, a 10 year warranty and a 100 night sleep trial to test it out and make sure you like it. Honestly, I sleep like a brick in general most of the time, but sometimes the difference between going from five minutes to fall asleep to two and a half is just so sweet and helix sleep absolutely helped me get there i received the helix midnight lux which is a medium feel mainly for side sleepers and with more cooling options for someone like me who gets a little hot and it is fantastic and their black friday sale is running now so go ahead and go to helixsleep.com slash bricky and use promo code helixpartner27 to get 27 percent off your mattress purchase plus two free pillows and receive a bundle of free bedding with your Lux or Elite order. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video. And now let's talk Arcane. Riot Games, no matter what I do, you always find a way to bring me back into something that you're doing. One way or another, I, I just I just can't seem to escape. You can't seem to escape you. Even if I do escape some of your games, you always know how to win me back. And, and not many companies seem to realize that the secret to doing so is making a really good TV show. Arcane season two, the final season has been released in its entirety and I did a review on season one back when that launched. Personally, I find that review I did to be just kind of okay. I go through each episode chronologically and talk about them in detail, but I feel like maybe I've, I've grown a bit since then. Some of my criticisms I don't think hold up and I've changed my mind on a few of the others. So while I gladly will take the extra ad revenue if you decide to go watch the video, I'm happy to break down my points here to be concise. Season one of Arcane was a phenomenal eight and a half out of 10. And I'd say the strongest video game adaptation to date. It's stellar animation quality, top level voice acting, and generally dour atmosphere sphere was refreshing, especially when packaged some of the most superb art direction I had seen in an animated piece of media. My only major complaints were that I felt like it was a bit too preachy with its classism messaging, just being a bit too heavy handed, a few strange character decisions, and most importantly, an overwhelming feeling of characters being too safe. Since a large amount of the main cast are characters in League of Legends, it is generally assumed that they are all going to live and that deflates a ton of tension in the storytelling. You know, why, why would you ever kill off a major character that makes you a ton of money, you know? But to my genuine surprise, Arcane Season 2 was to be the last of the Arcane series. I was lucky enough to actually attend the premiere for the show up in LA, and while feeling extremely small fish in enormous pond. Uh, it was a genuinely incredible time, getting to enjoy it with a ton of obvious fans of the show and the creators who are clearly happy with the product they put out. This is something I really do want to pinpoint. The energy that surrounds the team that made this show and Riot itself is palpable. There was this fun mixture of anxiety and excitement in the room. That feeling of being extremely proud of what you've done and hoping praying that everyone else is just as happy with it as you are. So, am I happy? Yeah. Yes, no, I really am. Season two of Arcane is not as tight as season one. It has lows that are lower than its prior season, but on a whole, the entire second season coasts at a level of quality, I think above its initial season, dipping the same amount of times it peaks. I almost feel like a final rating is moot because there is just so much to dissect and so much to discuss that me saying, yeah, the first season was an 8.5 and this season is probably an 8.8. .8. Overall, it's a four brick show, passenger approved, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, holy hell, someone check on Necrit. Like, is he okay? Is he alive? Originally, I was going to go through this video episode by episode like in the last video. But then so much insane stuff happened, I was going to go by character to character. But then the last three episodes aired and now we're back to chronological. So we're just gonna throw shit at the wall right now, you know? What even is pacing? What is structure? This is a, this is a bricky video, bitch. We clown in here. Consistency be damned. Episode one.
Looking back at the first episode, it almost feels quaint, doesn't it? If you watched it all at once, I almost feel like you get this sort of whiplash. Episode 1 was the aftermath of Jinx's attack on the council, mixed with Caitlyn's slow descent into anger and Mbessa using that anger for political power. The big and important part of this episode was really the attack at the funeral ceremony, including, and this should not be unsaid, gigantic Zonite Chem Bear and Chainsaw Buff Mom Revenge and Sneak Attack. <laughs> Sometimes style is substance. But episode one really is a setup episode. It's almost purely people talking, and while there isn't much to say overall, it really is something that the show did need. Setting up people in all the various positions they need to be for the rest of the story to play out. I will say that the entire funeral fight scene sequence was one of the best action scenes of the in like the entire second season. There was a pretty palpable tension, but what I found to be the most impressive out of all of it was that even though I had zero fear of someone like Jace dying, ending it with the Noxian saving the day really made it still feel like it was serving a purpose. That is a storytelling thing that I need to applaud in season two the most for that it's something that bugged me so damn much lately. When I did my Black Ops 6 review, I was going ballistic over the constant misuse of stakes and tension because Activision is just another Disney and needs to sell their characters. No action scene carries tension because nobody is going to die because selling dead characters is hard. Marvel films really annoy me with this as well because even if they do kill one of them off, they can just yoink a version from a different timeline. But sometimes, you can still give those scenes a purpose, even with those issues. I don't think Jace, Caitlyn, or Mel are gonna die in this scene at all, but what it does accomplish is ties off a loose end with the Chem Baroness Lady by killing her off, gives Caitlyn a larger motivation to enforce a more militant role, especially after her mother died, and gives Mbessa and the Noxians a reason to push for that role, giving them more political power, especially because they save the day. This is something that they do masterfully well in season two. Most of the time when there is violence, it is done in a way to serve the plot, even if there is little peril for the characters themselves, at least most of the time. But genuinely good setup, classic episode. Your mom took my dick. The first act of season two is, is a bit strange to discuss because it involves a lot of plot lines that don't much feel like they matter in the grand scheme of the narrative. If you're like me, hot off the heels of the insanity that was act three, you're probably thinking, oh my god, I totally forgot about the evil little yordle Chem Baron rat guy. Because I certainly forgot about him. Even more so when the character interactions here sort of uh, fizzle out in the end. This episode mainly comes down to Caitlyn and Vi going through Zaun to get Jinx and being the shit out of anyone in their way while wearing the coolest gas masks ever that remind me of the Tempesta Scions a lot. Oh yes, I'll take Guy who has only seen Boss Baby for 500 please. But the whole Chem Baron Undercity stuff involved a lot of Savika and she just doesn't really play a role in the end. I had a feeling she would be around a lot more considering her appearances in the first act, but no, she's basically completely absent in acts two and three. So while these episodes are good, they feel unimportant. That's my biggest criticism. I liked them and watching them at the time was great, but everything Zonite related pales in comparison to the other parts of this episode, which is Victor waking up and becoming Jesus. He gets up, he tells Jace to fuck off, and he genuinely goes down to the sump and becomes Jesus. I feel like the classism point in season one, which, you know, is a fine moral point to bring up, but it was just too heavy handed. That just is gone in season two almost entirely, but instead we get this one because holy hell, I, I've traded one villain for the other. It's so on the nose. He was already walking around like Jesus and acting like Jesus. I didn't expect them to literally do the kneeling shepherd thing and the big zoom out. Holy hell, do you get it? He's like Jesus. For the most part though, this whole event, this whole episode isn't really what I would call filler because it does have a cool action scene and some setup, but it pales in comparison to episode three. <laughs> Okay, 
Finishing the premiere and not being able to talk about episode three for a week and a half was a miserable experience because holy hell. To remind others, in season one, the third episode end of the first act is when Vander gets killed as well as the other kids, and then you get the big time jump to older Vi and Jinx in episode four. You know, emotional trauma, the episode. Cinema, as they say. Episode three opens with a pretty badass song of the Pilties raiding through the lower levels and then supersets that shit with the goddamn Black Rose. Now, I can't imagine the average audience member knowing who the hell the Black Rose are, and I was quite surprised to see them here. While there are a few little winks to them here and there, I didn't expect a fully blown Black Rose infiltration to occur, and I also didn't expect them to add another evil force and dynamic to the series that already had quite a few of them at the moment. Small history lesson. The Black Rose is an ancient organization of aristocrats in Noxus. They're part Illuminati, part Cabal, part evil sorcerers and witches. And LeBlanc is one of their main champions. I'm sure you recognize LeBlanc. Noxus is split between three main principles of strength that rule it. Vision, strength, and guile. Ambessa mentions this while sparring with Caitlyn. Vision is Swain, strength is Darius, and guile is a mysterious figure that never shows their face. Could be LeBlanc, could be someone else, don't know. But clearly Clearly, Ambessa is gunning for a fourth spot in a way, as she mentions it in her sparring session. Now, the Black Rose aren't good people, and they engage in all kinds of sabotage, destabilization, coups, that good stuff, but their end goal isn't to destroy Noxus, it's to destroy Brazil. But clearly, some shady stuff is going down between them and Ambessa, because they were the organization that took her son and killed him. They mention a feud and her search for something. It's all very mysterious and new, but it also clearly adds a sort of ticking clock aspect to Mbessa. She clearly has more than just a desire for power and war. There is something after her as well. But who cares about that shit, right? Who gives a shit about that stuff? Vi and Caitlyn have a kiss. Let's fucking go. They finally did it. Yippee. Oh, you should have heard the cheering at the premiere when this happened. It was deafening, which makes the entire next scene all that much sweeter. The big climax of Act 1 is the showdown with Jinx at the end of the underground, while Jason, Echo, and the Donger make their way to the center of the Hex Core, whatever it's become. The realization is that by using the Arcane in such a manner, it isn't a one-way trip. Utilization requires a form of mutual exchange, and with Victor out there, you know, raising credit scores, this is super unstable. This fight is fantastic in so many ways. It's decently long, which is lovely. It's choreographed really well, and the song playing in the background just hits very strongly. What I particularly love about this fight is that I can follow the action very well. A small complaint I had with the first two episodes is that the action scenes are a little style over substance sometimes in their choreography. The fight between Savika and the little rat thing is visually stimulating, but it's a little over stimulating. It's so fast and the amount of cuts gets a bit distracting. It's a little hard to follow what's going on. You know how John Wick is hailed as one of the best action movies? That's because they tend to zoom out with a nice wide shot to show all the action going on smoothly. Episode 3's big fight still had a lot of that style, but it definitely felt a bit more zoomed out and I could follow it a bit better. There are also just some great tidbits to it, like when Caitlyn bites Savika's hand, you obviously expect her to then drop her, but she's a hardened woman and just grins. Plus, the effect of the arcane screwing with all the Hextech items in the fight, paralleling the other trio dissociating from reality, it's a good mix-up. The ending scene is something that put me in a bit of two minds, though. On one hand, I hate hesitation. It's something that media in general, like even when warranted, they do it and it bugs me. I get it, I get why, I understand it, but it feels so annoying. I felt the same way with the Echo and Jinx fight on the bridge in season one. It just never feels good even if it makes sense. It's like a misunderstanding being the main plot point for a story. It's always aggravating. But on the other hand, Caitlyn going full bloodthirsty mode is pretty cool. Blasting off a finger to start with and being pretty happy to Swiss cheese a kid to get to Jinx, and her not being allowed to do that, therefore cutting off the relationship with Vi, folds perfectly into Ambessa's plans and giving us Commander Caitlyn doing the Wolf of Wall Street thing. The entire Commander Caitlyn ending piece is just 
excellent. It's got the best tension, it's cool, it, it ramps the stakes up really well. Oh, Mel also gets yoinked into the Shadow Realm, I forgot about that, so that's fun. But in season one, I felt like Vi's story overshadowed Caitlyn for a good margin, and Kate was kind of just around. Not important enough to the story. Now, I feel the opposite. I think Vi is actually not developed very much at all in season two, and is a bit one note, where Caitlyn goes through multiple character arcs throughout these episodes, and her transformation into Commander Caitlyn was just pure cinema. It looked so good. The entire last five minutes of this episode, the foreboding, the changes, the Noxian schemes coming to fruition, it was truly a great ending to the first arc of episodes. Not as emotionally charged as the end of the first one, at least season one, but with a similar feeling of just gravitas. I have an audience with the Masons Guild first thing in the morning. Let me guess, complaints about the Noxians. Damn, she got over that one quick. I may sound like a broken record here, but each act of the season does tend to go through similar paces. Set up in episode one, rising tension in two, climax in three. This one seems to be no different. It's actually a decent time skip overall, though I'm not sure for exactly how long. Jinx is enjoying her foster care of the new kid Isha. Madarda still can't get Hextech to work and can't find her daughter either. And the trio of goobers is nowhere to be found and martial law is in effect. Fun little bit here. Brutus is exercising his power with martial law, and normally this scene here is to illustrate their complete disregard for their citizens. But because he's a diehard Noxium, he understands people better, and so not only does it show that he's overreaching in his power, but he was right. He finds a Zonite member of the Undercity and beats the shit out of them until they tell him where the meeting will be. Neat little twist on that usual convention. By doing so, they raid the Zonite meeting and haul their asses away to jail, in which Singe does what Singe loves to do and utilize horrifying creatures for his own bidding. I'm gonna fly through episode four a bit quick because the real meat of the matter, heh, is the end and Warwick himself. Warwick was teased a bit in season one, but what really makes it a bigger deal is that instead of the big bad wolf man, the base game, this Warwick is used as a weapon by utilizing the corpse of Vander in episode three of act one. And holy shit, does it go on a terror. Warwick is really cool in the show from an animation perspective. Though I won't lie, I think his face is a little funky. They've made it a certain way to look more like Vander, which is fine for the show, but it throws me off a little bit. But of course, since it's Vander, they are doing the usual, the beast recognizes real, and that right there is powder that makes you say real. And it almost immediately segues into episode five. But I did really like all the Warwick stuff in four. The horror, the general fear, the bloodshed. It was it was pretty brutal and it was awesome to see. So while I'm a little iffy on Warwick's inclusion here, it did look really neat. Years of hard work leading up to this moment. Why the f am I being slimed? Episode five of Arcane is an episode that I also don't really have a ton to say about, or at least 90% of it I don't. This is the fault of the ending of the show a little bit, and also because the rising tension generally goes the way you are expecting. Vi enters her goth emo phase and is reunited with Jinx after the time skip to fix Vander's furry phase. Mel has been sent to the Bane Pit from the Dark Knight Rises, and Jace looks like he was just told a Chris Chan synopsis. So let's do Vi, Jinx, and Vander. Their whole couple of scenes were mainly for reconciling their differences a little bit and to give us some really wholesome flashbacks of Vander, Silco, and Vi's mom before everything went to shit. There actually isn't too much to chew on outside of some recontextualizations with Vander and a couple fun fight sequences. Other than that, they succeed and are able to take a real painful gamble in appealing to his humanity, especially before he was about to turn Vi into strips of meat. It's heartwarming, definitely, and will surely last a long time. <laughs> Now on the other side, the Bane Pit, and if I'll be honest, a lot of the Mel stuff in season two, it just didn't quite do it for me. I feel like a lot of her scenes, while still up to an arcane level standard of acting and visuals, are too deliberately confusing to be interesting. The Black Rose is a shadowy and weird organization already. Her being stolen, somehow, and put into this fake pit with her now alive brother, dials of the confusion even more. Now that would be a good way to keep me engaged, but then it is revealed this isn't actually her brother, and the whole area is 
another game being played by the Black Rose before Mel then has her eyes glow bright orange and explode out of her confines before hard cutting to black. A really important thing when it comes to making stuff confusing is to at least dangle a little bit of semblance of what is going on so there's at minimum something to ground it. The Black Rose, especially for new viewers, are nebulous and seemingly can do whatever they want wherever they want, or at least we haven't been told otherwise. They want something involving Mbessa that we don't quite know. They kidnap Mel somehow, then they take her somewhere we don't know, tell us her brother is alive, then tricks us on that, and she isn't actually somewhere we don't know, but back into the Shadow Realm. Then she explodes with light that we don't understand. It's too much. There is no grounding aspect and it makes me start to check out of the plotline. Some of it is explained later, but not a lot of it, which doesn't help. And that's unfortunate because Mel was a really good side character in the first season and her political games were fun to watch. But here though, it's just not the same. On the other flip side, her boy toy, however, isn't doing so hot. Considering this is the first we have seen of any of the trio who got lost in the bubbling arcane ball near the end of episode five, I was really wondering what they were going to do with them. Jace coming out looking like he named his hammer Wilson with a brace on the leg off his medication was not on my bingo card. And Sallow also immediately being turned into a paste on the floor was also not on my bingo card. But God damn it, fuck bingo. I wanna see where this game is going. The final climactic episode of Act 2 has Vi and friends taking Vander to get treatment in Victor's midsummer camp, which is not where I was expecting them to take Victor. At least I'm still stuck on the old Victor in my brain, you know, maniacal Russian robot man Victor. When season two started, he was the one I was the most interested in learning about, because like, how the hell do you get from that to this? Now is when I was starting to think like, Maybe they never are gonna take him in that version at all. And this is just a totally different direction. That said, the five finger placements on everyone's face is a super rad design. And there was a just general tension in the whole camp, not just because they look like religious cultists, but because Jace is off his rocker and the Noxians are around being shitters, especially now they have singed in their leagues of legends. Okay, so I have a ton to discuss on the ending of episode six, mostly good and a few bad. Right now, Jace is entering the camp and losing his marbles. Damn, Jace. Does the hammer have like a child seeking function or is this like a prejudice we should know about? But we get the big reveal that Caitlyn helped Vi get out of Mbessa's containment and you know, the, the double betrayal in a way. The scene is cool. The whole punching the net is a decent touch and I also like how long Mbessa was able to fight it off before eventually being knocked out cold. It shows her general resolve. But I can't help but feel like Caitlyn's change here was a bit sudden. Clearly she's not a total warmonger like Mbessa is, but it has been a decent time skip since the end of Act 3 and I can't help but feel like there wasn't enough to set up her turning on Mbessa. I mean, I didn't expect Caitlyn to be the villain or stay on her side the whole show, but I did expect to maybe last a little longer or at least flesh out her insecurities on it a bit more before she turned against her. Still, it does up the tension a bit because Singe clearly wants the blood from Warwick to help save his daughter's life. Who's Oriana, by the way? And Jinx and Vi want to, you know, make their dad not a horrible monster. So they're gonna give him to Magic Jesus to see if things can be fixed. So it's good tension building overall. There's just one small, big hole in their plans. I swear it. So clearly what Victor is doing here isn't good, right? His attempt to evolve humanity with the arcane is already not having a great overall effect. And even visually, he looks like he's a puppet master carrying them on strings. There's also a neat little detail that when Jace and Cello are in the core room, Jace's breath is shown because it's kept cold, but Salo 
has no breath. They're not even, like, human anymore. There's no breathing. Victor assumes he knows best for all in his evolution of humanity, but what he's doing is clearly immoral, leaning on barbaric. A sacrifice of humanity that he never had. And considering the fact that every single saved person lets out a blood-curdling shriek of death when Victor kicks the bucket, I'd say Vander wasn't gonna be much better trading one slave master for another. Still, haunting scene here. I was sitting mouth agape, thinking the whole time, no, they didn't actually just kill him, right? I mean, they're treating it like they killed him, and that's a big fucking hole in his chest, but not Victor, right? Like, we aren't even in glorious revolution mode yet. Evolution mode. You know, with the little laser hand. And if it wasn't enough, the Noxians are here, and they're pretty pissed off, and they are shanking the shit out of Dad. And hey, listen, Jace may not be directly responsible for this, but he did make Hextech, and that little kid did decide to atomize themselves using Hextech. So as far as I'm concerned, Jace is now two for three on the child killing. Jinx's mental health can look like the Dow Jones with how it's fucking ricocheting all over the place. Oh, you know, I really like Arcane. I really do. Like, where else can you get such distilled amounts of pure human misery all in one place? Jace kills Victor, Powder's friend turns to powder, Vander receives the Detroit Become Human treatment. What a time. Lovely. My new intro. <laughs> okay. Episode 7. Episode 7. What a fascinating episode this one is. I think episode seven might be tied for the best episode in the entire series. It's just really hard to beat out season one, episode six, you know, the flare and everything. Normally, normally, when shows do the whole side quest episode, it's annoying. When something insane happens in the prior episode and they decide to stretch it farther by having a filler one. But this one is both. Not very fillery and extremely engrossing. It ping-pongs between what happened to Echo and Donger, as well as what happened to Jace. It also is probably the greatest representation of the kid in the pool meme that I can think of. Echo and Donger are sent to another reality where things are different. He embodies a different version of himself in a world where Hextech was never invented and the heist in Piltover resulted in Vi's death. There's an interesting thing to gleam from this. I know it's not intentional, but just the idea that Vi dying early on would make the universe a better place and this thriving environment where the Undercity and Piltover are together is just really funny to think about. It's not what it means, but it's hilarious. Jace, on the other hand, I thought was being sent to the Void, but in reality, it's just an arcane timeline jump of sorts, where the arcane is completely overtaking everything. He's really not doing well, mentally or physically, in a place where he's completely alone and being assailed by God knows what. The juxtaposition of Echo living a happy life where everyone is alive while getting to be with the girl he likes, and Jace living the worst day of his fucking life makes for some really good viewing. It also feels like it breaks the formula a bit from their original act structure of setup, tension, climax. It feels almost like this episode is a combination of setup and climax. So much is revealed to us in that just interesting, bizarre way that it explains the prior act. And, you know, recontextualization is so damn good. And it's filled with just A-plus moments. Donger's little banjo song in the middle, the genuinely heart-wrenching dance and kiss scene between Echo and Powder, the visuals and camera work with Jace at the top of the tower, with the mysterious figure following him. It's just A plus scene after A plus scene after A plus scene. I genuinely adore all of it. And the more I talk about it, the more I get the feeling it probably is my favorite episode of the entire series. It just has everything. And it's a side quest episode, which is wild that it's so damn good. And it also gave us the creation of Echo's time travel device, which I completely forgot was part of his story. I got so engrossed in the new Echo, I forgot he was the time guy. It was such a, a seamless addition. It didn't feel forced at all. And I was actually kind of sad at how little Echo we were getting with this show in general, but they put him right back into the spotlight. And I'm so glad we will get to see it last. <laughs> 
Sam and Frodo's gayness. Okay, so now we have the penultimate episode of Arcane, and it opens with Mel apparently being a mage. Or a sorcerer. I guess I suppose definition is nebulous. Isn't like a like a mage, someone who learns it, a sorcerer, someone who's born with it? Or so would she be a sorceress? Or is that like a derogatory term? Because she calls like the, the weird black rose per it doesn't matter. Mel apparently can do crazy ass magic. And that's what's been going on and has been released from her confines to be sent back to deal with Mbessa, who is currently mourning and burying Brutus, who, I won't lie, didn't expect to live this long. Can I offer something that I really appreciate? A common trope in a lot of medium is the special object, item, or person that can simply not be harmed by any kind of conventional means. They are completely unassailable whatsoever. And therefore, our heroes require a MacGuffin to even do anything to them. One thing Arcane does that I appreciate immensely is that everything can be defeated with the right amount of force. And it also likes to break normal action conventions utilizing character strengths. I mentioned one earlier, you know, Caitlyn biting Zaviga's hand, but she just smiles. That is an example. A lesser writer would take the Warwick fight scene in the prison and have him completely shrug off any and all shots from Jinx's gum. Now, he almost does that, but they clearly show it has an effect on him, at least to a certain amount. Warwick is not an unstoppable creature in a literal definition, he's just very close to an unstoppable creature. And I feel this way a lot with the Noxians in general. They are constantly shown to be extremely strong and prolific fighters, but they aren't totally invincible. Ambessa is extremely strong, but still gets knocked out by Caitlyn's electric net. Everything with enough force is beatable, and by showing the audience this when a new creature or character comes on screen, it pins that in the back of your head so you know it can be beaten conventionally. Brutus was a really good henchman character. He was generally intelligent and extremely foreboding. Jinx gave him a bit of a run for a little bit, but you know, he won and would have killed her if Vander didn't interfere. But what's particularly enjoyable are the anti-magic runes that they keep utilizing. Noxians are no strangers to magic, Swain and LeBlanc especially would like a word, but they prioritize the strength of the individual above all, which makes them acutely vulnerable to things like magic. So having things to burn prevent that is not only intelligent, but very useful as a plot point. These special warding runes were used to save them from the Black Rose, were used against Jinx with the fight against Brutus, and now are being used by Ambessa for the final climactic ending. I just really like how good they are at showing that everything is strong but not unstoppable. Even magic has its limits. This saves you from making a trap of creating an unstoppable force that our heroes beat with a load of buckshot. Nice Eldric Horror dipshit now check this out. At least now we know that the enemy isn't weak to buckshot. They're just weak to a shitload of buckshot. Speaking of shot, Jinx's mental health. The overly long hair in the jail cell thing is a pretty good look and damn, she was really on the up and up, but uh, that isn't doing so well anymore. I do want to make an interesting point here as well. In the season one review, one of the things that I criticized was an overabundance on crazy girl Jinx flashbacks. I made the assumption that all these flashbacks were obviously to show that she's not mentally stable, but instead to remind the viewer of what happened in the prior act, which is something I have a particular pet peeve against. That being hand-holding the audience, it, it drives me up a wall. One of the biggest pieces of feedback levied against me on that point was that this was not about handholding the audience, but about an accurate depiction of PTSD for Jinx. I did not agree with that sentiment back then, but I might be more forgiving to it now, mainly because they basically don't ever do it again in this show. And if you were gonna do it, you would do it season to season as opposed to episode to episode. And the times they do do it, which is like, one to two times, neither of the points is to handhold the audience, it's to show a relapse caused by her trauma. So that does make me retroactively change my mind a little bit on the first season, especially considering, you know, what's going on with her right now in this jail cell. Oh, and yeah, uh, meanwhile, Victor has ascended and turned into a porcelain doll. Allow us a moment of civility, Jace. All right. So fuck it. Glorious machine evolution. Maniacal Russian robot man. It's all gone. We're going into full modern art project at this point, and then bitches can move. It's kind of the 
final inciting incident and the last straw that pulls together the Jace Victor rivalry. See, in the old lore, they were just technological inventor rivals that turned really, really sour. Now, one of them is giving off the thousand yard stare and the other one is ascending to godhood with an army of mannequin soldiers. But hey! Like I said, it's real fast, it's real tough, but it's not unkillable. Apply enough force and you got it. They did it again. Let's go. But screw that shit. You know what it's time for? You know what it's time for? A council meeting against Noxus? No. A parlay with the Zonites and, and Pilties? Absolutely not. A gathering of forces for the oncoming war? Hell no. It's time for gross, nasty, lesbian prison sex. Don't worry about Jinx on the way to end her life. Don't worry about it, Vi. Don't worry about it. We are here to... Fisting. This scene it made me laugh, honestly, because the in the internet has like turned on sex scenes in media. I don't understand why they act all fucking prudish and uncomfortable at the idea of sex in a movie, but then go home and jerk off to shit that will put me on a watch list if I even heard it out loud. So I don't know where this weakness has become stewing in the masses online, but I gotta say, this is a pretty fucking tasteful sex scene. It's animated well, it goes farther than I honestly expected, and you know, it felt mostly earned. Like, damn, this was a long time coming. They had a sex scene in season one, too, with Mel and Jason. That was pretty good also. Do I think this is a little out of place tonally? Yeah. Do I think it's a little funny that it comes right after Jinx leaves to go off herself? Yeah, but Vi doesn't know that's what's happening, and like honestly, fair play. I thought it was a pretty tasteful scene. They did it pretty well, and apparently Netflix slapped their hand and told them, "Hey, you're going too far." So this is the the chilled version. <sighs> but then, with the fight against Jason Victor under City Gathering and Mbessa being proper pissed off. It's time for the final episode, the big climactic battle. Victor gets powered up, which means any attempt at saving Vander is officially removed and he gets to die twice. Now we're back to the old school Warwick and a brand new weird version of him that will definitely be sold for 1350 RP minimum. But first, we got a war to do. Hola. All right, let me let me check this right now. <laughs> Nine years. <laughs> Nine years ago. Christ. Oh, it's just, it's nice to see it reutilized in such a fun way, even if the fun way is Echo trying to stop Jinx from blowing herself up, just because there's, you know, it's a little powder still in you doesn't mean you have to turn to powder. It's kind of amazing seeing Echo in his final form, doing his little four second reversal in real time in just one of the best animated shows I've ever seen. Like we've hit his final form and it's awesome. I've been wanting to talk about this for the entirety of the video and I'm so glad we're finally here. This episode starts at Mach 5 almost immediately. We are thrust directly into the war and it is one of the best scenes of the entire show. I'm gonna do the boss baby thing right now. I'm sorry. I have to. Warhammer has its own streaming service, Warhammer Plus, and it's not very good. I respect animators. Naturally, of course, it's a hard damn job, but either budget or time is not on their side, and most of Warhammer Plus stuff is not very good. But I'm aware that Warhammer is a very popular thing at Riot Games, and nothing has made me more interested in seeing their interpretations of it with this animation studio, especially with this first half of the finale episode. It's so visceral so smoothly executed and so heart pumping that the idea of turning this into some kind of 40k property gets me lightheaded because all the blood's going elsewhere. It has so much ingenuity in it. The Noxians doing their shield wall that can easily block a bunch of gunfire, the Pilties using gigantic cargo containers as like heavy weaponry. Such an interesting concept. The giant boats, the drums, and when the Noxians get close, you know, the, the rest of them kind of fold because you have the, you know, strong melee versus squishy Ranged. I've seen what happens when a fed Darius ease a Caitlyn. Though, in this whole thing of cinematic battles, as awesome as they are, there is one thing that kind of left me a bit confused though. So in the beginning of this season, I didn't mention this prior, we're introduced to a few other Piltover cops. This fish guy, the young gal, and the hardened bearded dude. I call them by these names because I genuinely forget what their names actually are, despite knowing that I've heard their names in the show. Like, I, I was told what their names are, but I just don't remember. Fish guy is just around. I don't remember if he dies or not. I don't think he does. I think he, I think he lives. 
Uh, the young piece of ass that Caitlyn had for a bit actually turned out to be a Noxian spy, which I do think fits with the theming, even though it's a little abrupt. Like, yeah, Mbessa would have spies. Just because Nox is all about strength doesn't mean they don't like subterfuge. But then there's the big bearded guy that Vi hung around with a little bit after Caitlyn got all warlordy. But what throws me here is that each of these characters felt like they were supposed to be something at some point, they have a decent amount of screen time in the beginning of the show. Not like a ton, but enough. Fish guy just fades away. Uh, warm body here ends up being a spy and Mel helps her serve her due punishment. And the big guy just gets shot a few times with arrows on his container turret and he just dies. Like, he just dies. There's no fanfare. He is just killed as easily as like a random faceless Piltover cop would get killed. Which, like if you're gonna do the horrors of war, look at how quick your friends die type thing, I would get that, but they aren't doing that. It almost feels like they just added them to the story to kill someone off, especially since they're not gonna do that with the main cast. Oh wait, I totally forgot. Heimerdinger's dead. He sacrificed himself to make Echo's project work and got atomized. Oh, there's no dongers to raise anymore. Oh, shit. That's right. Well, it, it's fine. It's just Heimerdinger. Like, he was a side character in a different universe. It's it's not quite the same. Of course, then you get the awesome, the tide has turned sequence where Jinx and her hot air balloon comes to rain fire upon everyone. And you basically get a major three-way cinematic battle at all at the same time. Vi, Jinx, and Echo versus the Ascended Warwick, Caitlyn and Mel versus Mbessa, and then Jace and Victor. But that's a very one-sided interaction. But there's so much to talk about here. I risk me getting off track. Uh, this whole sequence is great. It's genuinely intense and you have some real emotional stakes in all the various battles. The Mbessa one is a personal favorite because I just, I love how much she trounces them barehanded and the utilization of the runic wards in her arm does a great job at making the fight more interesting. That one ends rather interestingly. Caitlyn takes a gamble by slicing off the wards from Mbessa's arm by allowing her knife to pierce her face and eye. And you don't really notice it super well at first, but the eye patch later shows that, yeah, no, she got, she got gouged. Using this opening, Mel uses the pendant she got from the sorceress to deal a killing blow to Mbessa, but not after realizing who is behind all of this, which is generally assumed to be LeBlanc. Better to not trade one villain for a worse one. I have little negative to say about this whole sequence, minus the Black Rose stuff just feels underdeveloped, but the whole fight choreography was great, and Bessa's death didn't feel cheap. She was a fantastic villain. I loved her just about as much as I liked Silco in season one, and I really liked Silco. She was just so well-defined, smart, strong, posed a genuine threat, A+, plus, incredible character, completely happy with how she ended up and how she went out. No complaints with Mbessa. Now onto the Victor side of things. I'll be honest, now that I'm more aware Maniacal Robot Man Victor is completely dead and Strap isn't happening, I'm trying to uncouple myself mentally from that and my preconceived notions. That being said, weird god mode Victor is neat visually until we get to his face. I do not like his face. I don't get it. I don't understand what I'm looking at. I get the vibe of some kind of animal but it's so static and confusing. I get that we're separating Victor from his old form of him to his new form, but I do think you could have utilized a somewhat similar visual to the old. Old robot Victor has that kind of Iron Man looking mask with the glowing eyes, right? Could we not have just done a similar looking mask, but made it with like the porcelain puppet look in STEM, the jet white and the gold regalia, but with the glowing eyes part? I feel like that would have tied it to the old design just enough to not Feel like it completely missed the mark while still fitting with the character. I don't mind the rest, the staff, the laser arm, I'm fine with all of those being the ascended version, but like, yeah, the face just doesn't do it for me. I feel like doing an old version of Victor's face with the clockwork soldiers would have been really cool. And it kind of sucks because those clockwork soldiers are awesome looking. Their design is incredible, but it all comes to fruition. The ultimate realization moment. Jace and Victor at the top of the Piltover Tower, and there they are. The same position he found them when he was going through hell. The puppet master putting everyone on strings and we get the classic monologue of Jace, human emotion is gay. I depicted myself as the Giga Chad and you as the Soy Jack. I will remove everyone's ability to choose. I will hold them as puppets and that's fine because their emotion is stupid. Feelings are dumb. And if it was for any other character, I'd be annoyed with it. I'm a little annoyed with it still. I've seen this trope many times before, like, 
It's a little aggravating hearing Victor basically spout resin evil villain monologues, but the scene does look cool, so that's cool. But when we really get the mind fuckery going, it's everything past this. The big reveal, that's what they call it, it's the big one. Alas. So future Victor realized that maybe making the entire universe a whole bunch of Miles automatas, you know, it's a bit cringe. So after Echo becomes the biggest badass ever and saves the day by applying a time bomb to the man's face, showing that old lonely Victor set off all of these events in motion himself to stop him from doing what he's trying to do. The mage that originally saved Jace, the man who sent him back, all of it was your classic time paradox to get him to not, you know, enslave the world. Which naturally, seeing the older version of himself tell the younger version that he's extremely dumb for doing this, and along with the help of Jace's insight to it all, has him undo what he is currently doing and relax on the whole godhood thing. What happens after this, I don't even fucking know. They say they are finishing this together, and Jace's wrist rune acts up all crazy, and then the souls of the puppets all go together in a giant vortex, and the rune explodes, and they all get sucked into it and never seen again. I will be perfectly plainly clear here. I have no idea what the fuck just happened. I'm sure there's a lot of metaphorical here, especially with how they adjusted the art style for this big and crazy sequence, but truthfully, I don't know what the hell's going on. Did they go back in time? Did they get sucked into the arcane crystal? What is life inside the arcane crystal? Also, where's the crystal? That shit's gone too. Are they back in time in the crystal? I have no goddamn clue, but Singe said that saving his daughter was dependent on Victor's survival and Oriana is right there. So at the end, I imagine he's alive. But after that, I have no goddamn clue. It's pretty and emotional, but I'm sitting here dumbfounded at what happened, which is total tonal whiplash because directly after that, Jinx ends up still being attacked by a Louis Vuitton Warwick and falls to her death at the bottom of the tower. Turns out, um, Heimerdinger and Bessa and Jinx. Fuck me, I guess. They're just gonna straight up kill League of Legends characters, aren't they? I would say no body, no kill like I always do, but we have Bessa's body. It's right there. And Donger doesn't have a body. It was atomized. So, um, shit. And that's where it ends. Like that, that, and that's Arcane. No, seriously, that's basically where it all ends. You get a little funeral thing at the end. Vi and Kate share a little conversation. Echo has no bitches. Mel's on a boat back to Noxus, and that's it. That's where it ends completely. And that, right there, is my biggest knock against this season. Season one ended with a cliffhanger, absolutely, but a lot of its overarching stories were tied up. Still lots of room, but knowing that there was a season two gave it some extra credit. This time around, this is the last season of Arcane itself, but they do have other shows planned for the future that take place in other regions. But to me, that doesn't excuse what feels like a really unanswered and lackluster final wrap up because there's just not enough time in the sun. Savika and the Undercity almost completely forgotten about until the final moment, and they barely played a part in the war outside of maybe a 30 second scene of them arriving to punch stuff. Black Rose, if you don't know deep league lore, this is a massive, well, what the fuck was that moment? Who was the deceiver? I know it's LeBlanc, but like, you know, they don't really flesh that out either. What was their goal? What were they after? Mel. Mel feels like she gets totally shafted here. She has barely any screen time compared to season one, and like, cool, she's a mage, but they basically take her story and backseat it, probably to say, you'll learn more in the Noxus TV show instead. Look, there's a swain bird, ooh. Jason Victor, God knows where they are. They never show up again, off to some forgotten faraway realm to do whatever it is they're planning on doing. Echo just ends up feeling sad despite him actually saving the entire story at the end, and Singe gets his daughter in a way, but not much else. You can absolutely open end these things. You are more than in your right to do so. But if you are the season finale of the final season of a show, it's expected to wrap it up a little bit better. A where are they now segment, if you'd be so inclined. Especially since you added multiple other forces pulling screen time away, so some things feel underdeveloped to begin with. The ending felt rushed. I feel like there was an entire extra episode's worth somewhere in the final two episodes that got cut cut out for time. But this is also what happens when you overload the show with too many threats and too many plot lines. A ton of like the Black Rose and Warwick plot lines just kind of felt unnecessary. Season one had a strong, identifiable
identifiable pair of villains, Silco and Jinx. All of our heroes were surrounding them. Season 2 had Jinx, but then it wasn't Jinx. And then they had Warwick, then it kind of wasn't Warwick, then it was Warwick again. And then there was Ambessa, who was also under assault by the Black Rose. And then there was also Victor and Singed. That's why I think Season 1 was tighter, because a lot of this ends up feeling a bit bloated and not tied off with a bow at the end. But that still being said, I do enjoy season two i think more than season one overall because while it was more inconsistent the highs were so high episode seven is such a banger and i still find Ambessa to be an extremely good villain not to mention the choreography and visual design of the whole show is something even stronger than the first season which i don't think i'd be able to say it just leaves me with a little bit of a sour taste knowing that a lot of the wrap-ups i was expecting at you know the end of the show will most likely be kept for another show down the line. There's also a small underlying fear deep in my chest that says that now that they have introduced the multiverse and time travel, no character will actually stay dead. All characters can be alive because all characters can be picked from another universe or timeline. It's a huge complaint I have with modern day Marvel stuff and also because the writing is ass. But despite it really enjoying my time here with the show, there is a little sense of dread. That sense might be alleviated in the next show they launch, if it's like a total banger, but it is there regardless. There's also a lot of talk about League of Legends lore being changed with Arcane and a lot of established canon going away because of that stuff. I'll be perfectly honest, while League lore is absolutely way better than people expect and give it credit for, that's not my hill to die on. There is a prevailing sense of, yeah, well, you know, that sucks, they changed the lore, but Arcane is so damn good, who cares? And that's an argument that can be settled by people who are not me. Honestly, I still consider this to be the best video game adaptation I've seen, though I do need to get around to watching Fallout. To me, what puts it above is just a level of filmmaking. Normally, projects around fan stuff, video games, or just smaller IPs are put together for cheap and with people who are cheap hires. Arcane isn't good because League. It's good because good. It's writing, it's choreography, it's script, it's visuals, it's actual film, it's cinema. And to get that from League of Legends, from Pizza Feet Tarek, from Brazilian Mordekaiser and Shotgun Knees Urga, which is a joke I didn't think people would run with so much. It's just what a timeline we're in. Complaints aside, Arcane is fantastic. It is so worth a watch, and I really hope the budget was made back up in the mountain of skins they will be selling. Because the only way for us to get more of these is that the bean counters say it's a good idea. You'll probably see me again for whatever the next show is. They haven't uh, gotten me back in the league yet, so I'm safe for a little bit while longer, but hey, you know. Depends on the show you make. Thank you everyone so much for watching. My voice is shot. I did this whole thing on camera like the last one. I'm tired. Arcane's great. Just, you know, a little rushed at the end there. Kind of was upsetting. Episode 7 though. Holy hell. God damn. Thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate it. Uh, check out merch in the description. There's a merch, spooky merch down there. Buy some stuff. Yippee. Uh, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.